<clears throat> yeah. So um, um, essentially, uh, they are trying to bring the return type into the signature of the function. So you can, they say it saves, uh, simplifies the syntax of the function, which essentially means instead of putting the return type over here, you said auto and an arrow, and you put the return type over here. Okay? That's what it is. They say, why? They give an example with this inner enumeration that we have, or inner class that you have. So you have over here ticket type, and because this thing is returning the ticket type, it's easier to, to simply say, um, where is the definition for it? So instead of writing ticket, ticket type, and then ticket get, you, you, so instead of that, instead of this, you write auto. So uh, where is that thing? So you write auto get const returns the ticket type and whatever the re return is going to be. I'm going to write the whole, I'm going to start developing something using only that so you'll see exactly what I mean. Um, so, and I'm going to keep using that for the uh, rest of the stuff. So it's going to be the same example over and over. So I want to create uh, a, a validated integer, a, a class that uh, encapsulates an integer so I can validate an integer. So essentially what I need uh, for this class is uh, um, a value that I have, right? And I have a string that I'm going to keep the message in it. If something goes wrong, I want to set that message to something. So later on, I can see what went wrong with this uh, integer. So essentially, I want to have the primitive integer that we have make it a nice integer. Now, if I want to do the validation over here, what is a good uh, name for a validation function? It's uh, Boolean valid, right? So valid. So I want to validate the function like this, correct? But that's not the syntax that we learned. We said if you want to have a syntax, you say auto, and then, oh, got it? Don't question why, learn it. You've got to find out later on why is it good, what is it good for. You'll, you'll find out that later on, it, you'll find out that later on uh, when you cannot prepare the return type of a function, like this, it's like uh, it's it's good for templates. Okay, <laughs> all right. There's a reason behind it. Yes, the type that you're returning. Yeah, exactly. So it's auto, and then after the arrow, what you return. So essentially, the implementation of that validation would be something like this. Let me see if I have something in here. Yeah. So, yeah, say the validation that I, let me just bring the other one up too. Let's say I want to create this integer for, uh, this integer class for, uh, uh, for a mark. If I want to do that, the validation function for this should be something like this. So I have auto, you see, auto int valid, that returns a Boolean, okay? Then I'm going to say, do the exact same thing that I did. So I'm going to check if it's less than zero or greater than zero. I'm going to set the message to invalid mark. Try again, and I'm going to set the result to false and return. Any problem with that? Yes. Anytime you like. Anytime you like. You can literally use this syntax from now on. Okay? Let's put it that way. Loud, loud. <laughs> it simplifies, as they say, it, it, sh it shortens the uh, length of uh, function definition when you have nested objects. Okay, when you have nest, you have, when you have, let's say you have an employee who has a class called name, and that class name has a class called first and a class called last. Now, if you want to return the first name of the employee, you have to say employee scope resolution, name scope resolution, first scope resolution to, to return that thing, right? Like this one, you simply say auto, and you return the type. 
what is the type that you have in your class. So you don't have to qualify the whole thing because you are within the scope of the class. Whatever you, or you can use dec type to actually fi find out what is the declaration of the type. And using Goto, you find out what is the type without even writing the name of the type and make it auto. So essentially, the return type will be decided based on the return value that you're, that you're using. Okay? Um, I would say, trust me on this. You're going to find the benefits later. But I, I don't have a very good example for you. The best example that you would see, read the notes, you will see that it actually saves few uh, name qualifications, makes it short. The red, the, no, no. The return type is based on what you write over there. Now, if at the type over there you have, you know, you remember what is the deck type? Uh, if you actually put that one, you can you can find out what is the type of uh, an equation, and based on that, auto, auto will set the return type to that. So if you are returning an object and you don't know what is the type of an object, you can say deck type and put the object over there. And it will find out what the type is and set it automatically to the value that you are returning. Yes, of course. It is, I'm just showing you what the syntax is. I'm, let's put it this way. C++ 11 and further has a new syntax for functions. This is how it is. You write an auto at the end for beginning, and you write what the return of is after. Why? Because the sky is high. Okay? All right? So just learn the syntax. Okay? <laughs> Let's put it down. Let's not put it too much under the microscope. When you do that, you won't learn. Okay? So you learn the syntax. Use it. When the time comes, they're going to say, ah, I can't do this with, with that one, but this one now I can. Then we'll understand how it's done. Okay? So let's learn the syntax for now. All right, so what did I do? Save. All right. All right. All right. Shush, don't laugh. All right. So next thing I want to do is the default constructor for it and the constructor. So I'm going to set a constructor for this integer. Set the value to whatever it is. I'm just going to bring the val uh, stuff up. Uh, so uh, that's the constructor. Of obviously, because constructors don't have return types, it doesn't apply to them, right? Um, if I want to get the value of the, if I want to get the value of the, uh, uh, if I want to read it and I want to write it, I want to get and a put written for this. Get reads and put writes. If I want to do that, if I want to write a couple of functions to that, this is going to be the syntax for it. So I'm saying auto get receives standard input and returns standard uh, i stream. Not standard, yeah, i stream. Okay? And I'm going to say auto put receives o stream. It is constant and returns o stream reference. Are we okay? I know he's kind of having a, a little smile of what the heck are we doing here? I'm just, I'm just using the new syntax for it, okay? Okay, and if I want to implement it, it's the exact same way, which essentially I say int, auto, uh, auto int get, uh, and I return my stream reference. The rest of the stuff is all done the same way. So essentially I'm saying get the value, um, uh, check the validation, otherwise uh, set the, uh, message to invalid integer, clear it and go out, ignore the uh, uh, number of uh, characters that is in a buffer, essentially flush the keyboard. Then uh, uh, if it's not done, print the message, go up. If it's done, get out. Everybody knows what lazy evaluation is. I already talked about it in class, right? I don't want to write an if statement, so I have my if statement within my while. Anybody have any problem with this? Why can I put C out over here in a condition? Because it's going to be, because it's going to, so uh, we said that uh, lazy evaluation is when you are having, for example, an AND statement, if the first one is true, 
to actually check to see if the whole condition is true, it checks the second one too. If the first one is fi false, it's finalized, it won't do the second part, right? Only if, this, if the second thing is actually a Boolean operation, is C out message a Boolean operation. How could I put it over there then? You are three, four, five. These things should be like that for you. Okay? Why can I, why I am putting C out as a condition over here? And if it's a condition, what is it going to get evaluated to? Okay, but, but is C out printing a message, a Boolean operation that's going to return true or false? What do you mean by problem? Thank you. So O stream is overloaded for Boolean cast, which means if it's put in a condition, it will be casted. The Boolean cast operator will call the fail function and return a Boolean as a result. Therefore, you can put a C out object as a, a Boolean value. It will be casted automatically to Boolean. Seriously? When you are to test and see if C in is successful, what do you do? To cast and see, let me just bring the main up. To cast and see if this C in is successful, what can I do? I can say if C in, it means success. Right? I can do that. How? How this magic happened? Pardon me? It's the fail flag, but how does it return the fail flag? The Boolean operator. How do you, ca you remember how we overloaded casting, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to do it for this integer. So we say to this, to see what, what can we do with the cast over here. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll take care of it. I'll explain. Anyways, there is something that you can overload. We call a cast up, cast overload, OP244, which means if an object is forced to be casted to something, you can hack into it. You can tap into it and say, if I am being casted to an integer, do this. If I'm being casted to a Boolean, do that. Okay, so um, for example, if I want, if I want, for example, say, where, if I want, um, say I want, if integer, this int of mine is casted to an integer pointer, I want the address of m value to be returned. How can I do that? I have to say operator integer pointer and if I want to return a constant I'll make it a const if not so that becomes the the cast for integer pointer it means if it's casted to integer pointer call this method and what does the and it doesn't have a return type because return type is the cast so it essentially says cast now, if I want to actually implement it, I have to do this. I have to say int operator integer pointer. And in here, I'm going to say return address of m value. Was it like this or int goes after? No, that is. That is it. Yeah, that's it. So essentially, in my program, if somebody does this, if I say integer pointer P is equal to val, it's not going to give me an error anymore. Why? Because left side is integer pointer, right side is val. Compiler says, let me see if I cast that to integer pointer. Can I cast it? Yes. What happens when it's casted? The address of m value is returned. Therefore, P will hold the address of val. 
Am I making sense now? The exact same thing is overloaded in, in I stream and O stream. It's operator boo. And what is it returned? Not fail. Literally, it returns not fail method, which means if it haven't failed, hasn't failed, it returns true. If it failed, it returns false. Got it? So if you want to see if it failed or not, you have two choices. Either you can say, like, if I wanted to see if C in is failed, I can say if C in dot fail, or I can say if not C in. It's the same thing. If not C in, it means if C in failed. OK? And because of that fact, because of that fact, I can put the C in or C out in a place of a Boolean thing. And because C out is always successful, it prints on a screen, it never fails, it will always return true. Because it's true, true in and is uh, uh, an, uh, a value that doesn't have any effect. Anything and to true remains the same thing. Correct? Remember that? OK. So if this thing is true, then because it's true and, it tries to validate this through validation. It executes it, therefore you see the message. If this thing goes false, false and, it doesn't need to check anything, so no error message is printed. Therefore, I don't have to write an if statement. This is something very, very normal in C language, not in C++. C++, of course. In C language, that's a very, very usual thing to write. All right. So again, so that's my get and that's my put, so, so that's how I set it. And if I want to overload, so this actually works with C in and C out, with new syntax, if I want to write C in and C out, this is how I do it. So essentially the, uh, the prototype for, the, for C in and C out will be something like this, right? Auto operator, and then it returns an O stream. It's the same thing. I know it looks, sounds funny and useless, but it's improved syntax of functions in C++ 11 and later. Okay, somebody wanted to just fiddle with you guys, so they did it. So let's put it this way, okay? And if I want to implement it, it's the exact same way, no difference. So you can do it like that. So, so you can actually implement it like this. So you say auto operator and it sets it and it's done. So essentially now everything is set. Now I say C inval and with the C inval it's gonna get evaluated. So my integer over there is a validated integer and I can actually uh, enter garbage stuff. So if I actually enter garbage, it's gonna say invalid integer. If I put minus 10, it's gonna say invalid mark, depending on what's going wrong. And it uh, sets everything uh, properly. So if I do 50, then it's gonna say 50. So, so um, I, do I need to walk through it or are we okay? You're okay with the validation, right? You're okay, right? All right. Uh, yeah, so the valid function sets the, the message to uh, invalid integer and the failure of, see I'm saying if I string, great, uh, so essentially this is if C in in M value. If it fails, it returns false, therefore, so if I, if I didn't want to do that, the kindergarten version of it would have been this. Oh my goodness. I had to write this, but I don't want to write it. So I'm using the, the implementation that is in there. So instead of writing not fail, I'm going to uh, have it written like a, like a pro like that. And are we good? Are we okay? All right. And that's the beginning. Now let's actually start uh, the good stuff, okay? All right. Um, Already I have written all these things, so it's written in a proper thing. So this main that you see over the prog.cpp, you're going to see it as this title. So the title will be 
PRG1C++17 function syntax.cpp. So you'll see exactly uh, what each uh, thing is when it's going into the code. So that's that. Next one. Two, two. Wrong one. Why did it open it over there? Cancel. Sorry, I wanted to open it in this one and bring it step by step so it doesn't frighten anyone, but it didn't work. So, open. One, two. All right, that's better. <coughs> All right. Uh, are we good for this one? Can, um, uh, can I move to uh, the next topic? Now, this is not the same. This is not the same sequence of the topics that are on the notes. Okay, uh, there are lots of stuff that are distracting. I'm not going to go through it. I'm going to talk about those at the end. Okay. Now. I have a question. When I when I write integer a and I write over here or let's call it print. So if I write this code Where is A? Where is A located? Somewhere in memory. Beautiful. Somewhere in memory. Some, it's a common mistake to call it in a stack, but yeah, in a, in a program stack. Um, where is B? B is in memory too, correct? Where is your whole program? When runs, it goes to memory, correct? All right. So if I have an array, where is the address of the beginning of the elements of the array? And if you don't know this, we're going to get really, I'm going to get really mad at you. This is IPC 144 and OP244. Integer A20. Where is the address of these 20 integers? No, no, no. If I want to see, if I want to literally print it, okay. If I have over here integer AR 50, I have 50, 50 integers or double, whatever. I have 50 doubles called AR. Where is the address of the beginning of these 50 doubles? It's, it's in AR. The name of the array is literally a double pointer pointing to the beginning of these 50 doubles. Are we OK with this? Literally. And what is the syntax to access every and each? It's the square bracket, right? So I say AR0, it's the first one. I go AR10, it's the 11th one, right? Are we OK with this? Now. Everything that you are writing, this double, that integer, print, main, they are all in memory, correct? Where is the address of function print in memory? The function, the logic, not the data, not the integer, not 25, not 62, the logic of the function print. Where is it in memory? Like an array. 
It is in the name of the function. So essentially, what I'm saying, if I do this, if I actually say something like C out, unsigned, int, I, uh, or let's put just unsigned, print, let's see if it's going to work out. If I run this program, this is where the function print is in memory. I didn't call the function. I used its name. That's why, like how many of you wrote the function and forgot to put the parentheses and you got the error message, if you want to get the address of the function, you have to remember that and you just ignored it? Because when you just put the name of the function without the operator that actually calls the function, so essentially parentheses, if you put it after any address, you are telling to the compiler, jump to this address and start executing the commands. Of course, when it's not a function, it doesn't know how to work. There is no signature. It doesn't know what to pass to it and all those good stuff. Are we okay with this? So you know we have two friends function. Pardon me? No, you can't. Now, don't go through. We're not going to go. Th we'll, we'll go through it. Yeah, when you have two functions, go print which one is what. If I if I have two and I put that one, then it's going to give me an error. It doesn't know which one you want to print. You have to qualify it. And for that, there's a complete different story. But we'll go through it. I'll tell you exactly what's going on. Okay? Give me two seconds. Okay. Are we okay down to here? Are we okay? So let's say if I have a, a function called add, and I say void add and a and b, and I say a plus b is a plus b. I, I print the values, right? I can actually create a pointer that is capable of holding the address of that particular function. What make that function particular? That's a function that receives two integers and returns a void, right? To create a pointer that actually can do that, you have to write the exact signature of the function. <coughs> Remove the names. Give it a different name. Funk. Okay? Now, what is, what is, what makes a type a pointer? How do you make a pointer out of a type? You add an asterisk to it, right? So let's add an asterisk. I'm going to put an asterisk over here. But no, if I do that, this actually means I have a function that accepts two integers and returns a void pointer, right? To make sure it's not confused with that one, I put parentheses around it, which means the asterisk belongs to func, not void. Now func over there is a single variable. It's a pointer that can hold the address of any function that receives two integer and returns nothing. Any function. Now, I can actually say, I can actually say func is set to add. Okay? And simply say func 10 and 2. And if I run this beautiful program of mine, three years later, you will see that it actually says 10 plus 2 is 12. So I actually called the function add using its address. Are we okay with this? And yes. Yeah. 
The parameter is 10 and a 2. It doesn't make any difference. You are calling function at. No, I'm only curious because if it's. Uh, you are calling function at. Oh, okay. Look, remove oh. func and put add instead. Do you have that question? No. The no. same, same thing. You are calling function at. No difference. You are calling function at. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? So, yes. Yeah, for. For, a fun for, for any function with that signature, which means if I have any other function that carries the same signature, it doesn't matter what. I can still add set for, so I can actually say func is set to sub now. And I can again say func 10 and 2, but because this time, but because this time func is pointing to sub, now the subtraction is going to get called. See? This pointer can point to any function that accepts two integers and returns a void. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? So is the function before you use order or is the function before function? Yeah, but don't, so say it. No, don't even go. No, no. Don't. Like, let's learn the thing and then we'll go, don't worry, I'm going to confuse the heck out of you in five minutes. Don't, don't, you don't need to. Let me be responsible to confuse you, <laughs> not yourself, okay? Now, not only that, you can even create arrays of pointers. So how you do that, I can say I have four pointers. So func0, func1, func2, and func3. They are all pointers to add, sub, multiplication, and divide. Now, in a for loop, I can write, call four functions. Right? Now I can run, for this, run this thing, and you will see that everything is called one by one. Why the heck we need something like this? It's actually a very beautiful thing. It gives you lots of power. And I'll tell you what, why, OK? Remember the integer we have written? That sucked. Let's write a better integer, OK? Let me tell you. Because that integer only validated for a mark, right? What if I want to validate for age? Why, write another function, write, write another class for it? Why do I do that? Didn't I just learn? that I can pass logic using its address to something else? Why don't I pass the logic of validation to my class? So my class can run different types of logic on its data based on request. Give me a second. No, it's not. It's actually that's, by the way, what you see is C language. It has nothing to do with C++ yet. Everything that you see is C. It's not C++. Yes. I have never done that. Try it. I don't know. I really don't know. I've never, like you say, if I say over here, Int, font, int, int, because it's not in a signature. It will, I have no idea. I was never crazy enough to do something like that. You do it next time. Come and explain to us how it works. OK. But void is the return type. Yes, it's the return type. So we cannot, we don't have it. We have it. No, you can see it, but you know that he's kind of right. That's why I don't know the answer. Because if you write two functions and you want to overload them in C++, the only thing that identifies is the name and the arguments, not the return type. So he says, because it's not in a signature, yada, 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 and I, my answer was, I have no idea. OK? So this actually, this, what you see right now, was how we did object-oriented programming using C when most of you weren't born yet. Because there was no C++. But object orientation was out there. 
So we wanted a, a, a structure to have functions, right? How did we do it? We put pointers to functions and we set it up that way. We tried to make it object oriented. So our structure has actually had functions, but it was, po so you, know, you see what I'm saying, right? So, so all these things are, okay, so now let's see what we can do with this thing. And it's gonna get more interesting as we go. So um, add existing item, let me bring those ints back. So it was int and an, and an int and int. All right, pause. Now let's continue. Now, so instead of this valid thingy that I have over here, why don't I keep the address of a function that can do validation for me? What kind of function would it be? Okay. First of all, the return type auto. <laughs> okay. The name of the fun the name of the thing I'm gonna call it m valid, because that's gonna be a pointer to a function that is going to do validation for me. But what it's going to get? First of all, to be able to do validation, this thing should return, get an integer value, right? To validate, correct? After it's done its validation, it should either return true or false, which means it's going to be Boolean, right? Correct? And initially, I'm going to set it to null pointer because I know it's just a pointer. But how about the second argument? Can I pass anything else over here too? Now that I'm doing the validation, and validation is highly tied to what I'm validating, right? If you're writing a validation for age, your error message should be for an age being invalid, correct? If I'm doing a validation for a mark, your error message should be tied to a mark being invalid, therefore, why don't I actually pass it a reference of a string to set my error message to? Not only that. So in here, I'm going to create, and I'm going to call it message out. So essentially, this becomes my point. So I'm, after writing this integer, if I, if I want to give this integer class to any programmer to use it, I'm going to say this integer class of mine receives, needs a validation function with following signature, which is integer, a string to set the values, and it should return a Boolean if the uh, thing is valid, and return a false if it's true, true if it's valid, and false, false if, if it's not. And then what I need to do in my constructor, I have to get that value, get ready for this big thing that I'm going to put over here and my constructor should receive, and I'm going to put a big name over there, validation logic address. So don't get scared. This is that. So let me just take this val out so you know the name is not needed. So essentially I'm saying get a validation address of a function that receives an integer and, uh, and a string reference and returns a boolean, and by default set it to null, and a value that is uh, so that's the integer value being set. There is nothing over there, right? And also, because I want to be able to change my validation halfway through, it would have been nice to actually have a set function that can change the validation function on the fly. So essentially, I'm going to put that val, val and mass message out over here because I like it to, to actually tell what the validation function is supposed to do. So my set function essentially sets the pointer to this value uh, when it's called so they can change the validation on the, on the fly if they need to. And so uh, the rest, uh, let me take this, uh, let's let that integer thingy be. Yeah, who cares? Uh, the rest are the same. Now let's bring the CPP file and see what we can do with that. So that's not much of a difficult thing to do. So essentially, uh, the, the constructor signature is only changed over here to what it was before. So essentially, this becomes your, uh, your constructor, correct? Uh, but this, uh, the validation that is coming in, your m valid will be set to, the, set to that. So m valid will be set to VLD. 
Be okay? So I'm saying, when they send me the address of the validation logic, keep it in that variable so when you need to va do validation, use that variable instead. Pardon me? It's in a constructor. So when you are constructing this, you have the option to give the validation logic to my class if you want to. Of course, if you want to change it or if you want to give me the validation in a later time, you can always use the set function for it to do it. Okay, and why is it this thing? Oh, and I don't need any validation function anymore because the, the, the programmer using my class is going to provide that. I don't need to. So, and, and the validation logic is essentially the same thing. So, in, but instead of done over here, I have to do two things. First, I have to see if there is a validation logic. I can't just call the function. Maybe there is no validation. Maybe I don't need to validate anything. If I don't, so I have to say, if not invalid, uh, sorry, invalid or oh, valid or, and then make a call to the function invalid. So the first one guarantees that the function is there. And if it's not there, it's going to set the done to true. True. It means I'm good. There's no validation. Just get the object. The heck with it. I don't want to do validation on this, right? And the second one says, now if there is validation, call the validation function, pass the m value to it, and let it set my message, error message, if it's needed. So that function will get my validation, my value, do validation on it, see if it's okay or not, return true or false if it was valid or not valid, and set the, valid, set the message to proper message if it's needed. Are we good? Are we okay? I'm going to show you the call and everything's going to go clear. Everything else is the same. So now if I actually look at the main, this is how it's going to be. So for the main, if I want to use the function, let me just get rid of this. So let's say I want to have, I want to get an age in a bar, see if I can sell them drink or not, and I want to get someone's mark. I don't know, for some reason I want to do the, for my, my daytime is teaching and at nighttime I bartender. So, so, <laughs> so, so, so that's it. So if I want to do that, first I have to prepare my validation logic, which means I have to have something like this. I have to say, okay, a valid, to validate age, I got to get the val and the error message. If it's less than 19, I'm going to set the error message too, wrong, too young to drink. Next, please. If it's greater than 100 years old, then this doesn't seem like a valid age value for a ball. If you're more than 100 years old, go rest, enjoy your life. Uh, so try again. Okay. And otherwise, everything is good. And if I want to see a valid mark, I'm going to say if it's less than zero or greater than 100, set the error message to invalid mark and return false, otherwise return true. Now I have the validation logic for it. Since I have the validation logic for it, I can create my integer, say int, val, zero, and for validation logic, use valid h. And I'm not going to pass anything. I'm just telling, why is it giving me an error? Oh, because I don't have include. Yeah. So now I'm saying, hey, integer, create an integer for me, set the initial value to zero, and your logic for validation is at this address. And I can do the rest exactly as it's done. So, and, and halfway through it, when I'm done with validation with age, I can set the validation to valid mark and use the same thing to get a mark. So I'm going to first run the program, and then I'm going to walk through it to see, to you, for you to see what's going on. So if I run the program, OK, remember what the error messages are, right? So in here, I'm going to just do garbage first. If I do garbage, it's invalid integer. That's the int working. It has nothing to do with validation. If it can't read an integer, that's what it says. I can't read an integer. Give me an integer. 
and clears it up. But if the integer that it's receiving is successful, now it passes the validation to my valid age function, and now my valid age function says too young to drink. Next, please. And again, if I do something else, it calls it and say it doesn't seem like yada, yada, yada. And if I actually put over here 55, now it's got your 50, you're good, you're 50, you're you old, what would you like to drink? Now, if I want to do for the mark, the exact same thing. If I do some garbage in here, that's integer doing checking for seeing failing. And now if I actually put over here, I don't know, 200, now it's going to say invalid mark. Now it sets it. Now it calls the other validation logic because it has a different address. So this is very useful, actually. You can create a function, a, a class that encapsulates certain things, but when logic is supposed to be dictated by something else, you can always postpone it by giving, the, giving it a specific signature and request the user, which is another programmer using your function, to provide the validation logic, the process logic, whatever logic you want. You want. Like you want to read something from somewhere. Create a read function, a, a signature for a read function that reads something for you. Now, if they want to read from a file, they provide that function for you. If you want to read from network, they provide that one for you. If they want to read from the keyboard, they provide that. So it's going to work for everything for you. You just, literally, the part that you cannot decide what to do, you give it to other programmer to write it for you. Are we OK with this? Yeah, you need to have for every single, so essentially for the integer itself that is supposed to take care of integer, do the casting and do all the stuff that is supposed to be done with an integer. The class does everything. Validation, you are responsible for it, not the rest. It's just an example for validation. You can use it for what? If you have two validation, write a function that does two validation in it. That's the beauty of it. They give you the signature of the function. Sky is the limit. You can do anything you want under that, under that logic. As long as your signature matches getting a value, validating it, setting an error message, you can do anything you want in there. Set it for anything you want. You are passing the address of logic, which means you can change your logic to whatever you want. It's a beautiful thing, actually. And again, this is just C. This is not C++. This works perfectly in C. The only difference is that the function calls in C, the only difference is that the function calls in C has to be done with an asterisk beside it. You have to put target of in C language. You have to put target of to call a pointer to function. Otherwise, the rest of it is exactly the same. Are we OK with this? We have lots of stuff coming in. So I don't want to pause on this thing too much. We have functors. We have lambda expressions. And they're all functions. And I'm going to implement all on this integer so you can see how the same thing can be implemented in, in many different ways. So the next one is going to be a functor. Functor is essentially what we call it a function object. So instead of a pointer to a function, you can make a function to be an object. No. This is stateless, which means these, these validation functions cannot hold a state. You cannot see what happened in a pre previous validation. It's just the logic. With functors, your function has a state. You can have member variables. You can have things in there and, and keep track of things as you go through. You can have many different resources in it. We'll go through that. That's the next one. That's C++ 11 and, and later. Functor is something new. OK? It, it is something new. OK? Are we OK? Can we take a break? I'm tired. I don't know about you, so 
Let's pause. Functors are essentially uh, objects masquerading themselves as functions. Objects that they make themselves look like a function. And I'll tell you how. Give me a second. So first, I'm going to, because now we are dealing with objects, I'm going to actually create uh, a validation. Dot h validation. Dot h, and I'm going to create a validation. Dot cpp. So let me take a look and see, uh, first, what do we have over here as example? Is it something worth it to sh uh, worth showing? Template equal function that a recursion stack function pointer. We talked about that. Area pointer functions, function objects. There you go. Yeah, so take a look at this. You know, everybody knows, like, this is bubble sort. So you know what it is, right? So it is doing a sort in here. And it wants to do a comparison and change the comparison to ascending and descending ba based on different cases. For that, it creates a class called compare. In that compare class, it creates a, a, a member variable. It's an enumerated thing to ascending and descending in the class order, as you see. And then, what it does, of course, it has a constructor that sets that order to whatever it's supposed to come in. So it can create the compare object with order being ascending or descending. Then it overloads the function operator. Remember you overloaded the index operator and you made an object act like an array? Remember that? It's the same thing, but it now acts like a function. What type of a function? a function that receives a reference of type t and a reference of type b and is constant. And b if it's ascending, it returns a greater than b. If it's descending, it returns a, a less than b. And, when you, and when, when you are passed, you can pass that object like any other object to a function. So essentially, you are telling my class will act like a function. And because you can pass classes everywhere, you can create instances of classes and pass them everywhere, you can pass your logic anywhere you want. It's a very simple fix or replacement for function pointers in an object-oriented world. So we could put functions in a class, in a structure, and we call that encapsulation. We say now our object can do things, right? Now, if your object is supposed to do validation and you overload the, the function call operator, then you can actually make it act like that. So essentially, what happens over here is this. You, you use the name of the object and the operator for function call. You pass the values, and the operator overload for it will be called and return whatever it's supposed to return. Now, this is with templates, a little confusing. Go at home and walk through it. Now, let me change the integer validation that I have done with a functor instead of a pointer to function. Hopefully, we understood what pointers to functions do, right? OK, now let's do it using a functor. So <clears throat> what I will do. Now I'm gonna make it look nice too. So what I'm gonna do over here in my validation.h, <coughs> first <coughs> let me set the <coughs> sorry. So I'm gonna say I have a class called validation. Let's say I wanna know. How many times user tried until they passed entering something? That I cannot do with 
pointer to functions. You may say, what if I create a static variable? You can, but then it's only one. You cannot have five different instances and each one taking tra track of its own thing. Okay? So now I'm creating a class validation, function validation, uh, uh, an object called uh, validation. It's, a, in, it's an interface. And I'm going to say it, it has a protected member called number of validations. And I set it to zero. And I have a pure virtual function for the uh, function call operator with an int val and an int string message out that we had before, right? Then I'm going to say, out of that class validation, create, inherit a class, and call that valid age. And my valid age implements the pure virtual function like, let me split the window, like, like this. So it's exactly the same function that I had over there, but this time it is in this validation thingy of mine. So, so it's the exact same validation that I have done over there, but the difference is that I am adding to number of validations each time they are making a mistake. And as soon as they are going through, I'll, I'll, I'll set it back to zero. Yes. You had a question? Yes. No? OK. All right. So, all right. So as you see, there's no difference. I just created a function inside the, the and the function you have seen, it's already the exact same function that I have written before. It has no difference. It's the exact same thing. And I'm going to. And I'm going to create another class out of that one. I'm going to call that valid mark. And my valid mark implements the operator, the function operator, like this, which is essentially uh, validating a mark. There you go. Right? Same thing. So I'm saying invalid mark value number of tries this much. At least you tried this much. This, so I don't know. I wanted to do something to show you that these things, they have states. They are, they are not like pointer to functions. You can actually hold stuff in it. So what happens is that if I use valid, if I create an instance of valid mark, I can put, I can call that object like a function. Let's see how. So if I go to my header file, it is exactly like the other one, but the difference is that instead of a pointer to a function, I am having a pointer to an object. Now, the reason I did that is because I wanted to sometimes not have validation. OK, so what I did, I could make it a pointer, so it could be null. If I made it a reference, then I had to have validation. You cannot leave a reference unassigned, right? So I left it like that. I made it a pointer. Um, but it works the same way. It's absolutely no difference. So now I have that. So it's exactly the same thing. But it's, as you see, it's getting more simple. Instead of passing that big gigantic prototype for a pointer to a function, I'm simply passing a, a pointer to an object called validation. That is the father of those or mother of those validations. I'm sending the parent's pointer. You see? And I'm sending the parent's pointer for set. So it's working the exact same thing. And if you look at the implementation of the class itself, it is almost the same. Take a look. Oh, this is int, not int three. If when you are looking at the t the notes on the web, I put numbers so you know which ones is which one. So I have int one h, int int one cpp, and prog one. So you know which ones are compiled together. Okay. So now, if you take a look at this, 
the constructor just passes that one, sets the validation and everything. But take a look. I'm saying target of, so this is essentially the name of the class, and I'm going to say call it. Because it's a function, I have to go target of, right? Because uh, if it wasn't, if it was reference, I didn't need to do that. So essentially, like if you want to make your life easier, um, um, what I'm saying is that because it's a pointer, you have asterisk beside it. Don't get scared at that, okay? If it wasn't, if it was just a reference, I didn't need any asterisk. I could just call a function with it. So essentially, it is, and because it's a pointer to a parent, because of virtuality, the latest validation is called, therefore the proper validation is selected depending on the object that I'm passing. And the outcome is going to be exactly the same. What the difference would be, what would be the difference? So this is validation, not validation three. This is validation. The difference would be that now I have state over here. So if I uh, put something like this, it's going to say number of tries zero. You haven't tried any time. Now if I do this, now it's going to say, so it actually counts how many times I tried. I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that with the other one. Now if I go over here 40 and I go out to the mark, it's the same thing. So the mark's state is different with the ages state. They are two different objects with their own state so I can do things with it. Or if it's more than three times validation because it was a password, I'm going to lock their account. Things like that. You follow what I'm saying? So that's the only difference. And these are functors. Functors are very useful. They come very handy. Uh, makes Make your life beautiful. Are we okay with this? You're not okay with this? Okay, you want me to write a very simple functor to see how it works? So, the heck with, oh, let me just, uh, the heck with validation. Uh, class. Adding. Um, public. Um, then I'm going to say over here, um, What do I say? So in here, I'm going to say um, int operator um, int a int b return a plus b. That's my class called adding. Right? Now, in here, I can say int main return 0. Now I can say over here, adding add int a 10 and b 20, c out add a and b. You follow what happened? That's a functor. What's the difference between this and that? I can pass this add through argument to whatever I want. I couldn't do that with a function. I can make three different instances of this and have different states for it. I couldn't do that with a function. That's it. Loud, please. I have very bad hearing. Yes, of course. But I'm giving that function an identity that I didn't have before. I Sorry, I give that function a container that I did not have before. Your standalone functions don't have a container. Your standalone functions are logic. You cannot pass them around. You, you don't follow what I'm saying? Yeah, that's the beauty of it. 
but it's not. It's an object. Look at add. Do you look like? Does it look a function to you? It's not. What I'm saying is, let's say over here, I'm going to say over here, int num set to zero. And I'm going to say over here, num plus plus. Well, num plus plus. In here, I'm going to say int count return num. Can you do that with the thing? If I call this add, I want to see how many times add is called. I can say add, see out, add dot count. Can you do that with a function? It's, it opens the world for you. You can do anything you want with it. It's a function that has state that you never had before. Essentially, what happens is that what is object orientation? To encapsulate, right? To put data and behavior together, correct? But when the specific behavior is iconic for you and identifies what the function is, what the class is, then that becomes a functor. Functors are nothing but classes. Any class that overloads the function operator becomes a functor. But then that, then essentially that function becomes an identifier. That's the main thing that, that that classes do. It is supposed to be designed that way. You shouldn't make every class a functor. That doesn't make sense. You could, but you don't. Whenever your action is something that needs state, when your action needs memory to remember what it's done before, you need to make it a functor. That's all. Uh, should I? Yes. This is the, the ultimate object-oriented program. This is like mother of all object-oriented programming. OK? This is an amazing thing, actually. This is a higher level of encapsulation. So you don't need to have a standalone function anymore. Forget about all the helper, schmelper thingies that you want to do. Now you can have objects. Point, point to, to functions. You're talking about pointer to functions? Yeah. Pointer to functions are not types. They are literally an address of memory. Instead of making your function visible for everyone, you pass its address around. <laughs> That's all you did. It's like itself. It's a pointer to a function. Don't try to make it it's like something, because that's going to, it's a point, it's an address of some logic in memory. <laughs> well, if this is a. <laughs> We can write nameless functions in C++. When you have a function, you want to write something. You know what, you know what macros are? No, macros are not. Okay, not a good example. When you want to do something only once and be done with it, you don't want to, you don't want, you don't want to have it called in five different places. You just want to just do something no. Let's bring back our uh, pointer to function. Where, are, where is my pointer to function? Let me just bring it to us int2, I think. So yeah, here it is. Let me just bring back my pointer to function. So int uh, header file. So that's the code for my pointer to function. I just deleted everything by mistake, but it, thankfully it went to recycle bin and I brought it back. So, <laughs> okay, all right. So, 
Okay, so that's that's the code that we had for our pointer to. So this is was the, this is the pointer to function that we have written, right? And let's get rid of the validation. So these are the pointer to functions that we have done. I don't want validation validation. I just want to use my pointer to function <laughs> to test something. So what I'm going to do will be this. <clears throat> I don't want to create a validation. I just have one validation, and I want to use this thing and be done with it. So what I will do, I'm going to say, create a validation uh, int for me. Remember that we could pass pointer to a function, right? Well. And let's say I'll, where's my int? Uh, so val, zero is the value. Now in here I want to pass a validation logic, right? I'm going to say create a function for me right here. That's the sign for it. You see that thing that you use for indexes of arrays? That means a nameless function. And I want to pass to this an integer value and a string reference SDR, that message R, right? Correct? And what do I want this thing to do? I want this to set the SDR, my message, To this and I want it to return this that's a function right all right and I'm done that's called a lambda expression a lambda expression is a function that exists at the moment. It's right at that thing and it's done. After that, there is nothing. And its address now is passed to the, to the pointer that you have in the other one. It's going to be used. So that lambda expression that you created over here will be called over there. And it works the exact same way. So instead of, so if your logic is small enough that you actually want to deal with your lambda like that, then that's what you do. So you create fu <clears throat> functions like this. Now, in here, this uh, has a specific, uh, this gives you, that tells you, because this is like a single command, right? But it has kind of a scope of its own. You want to see if what functions from outside I can use in this one. At one functions, what, sorry, what variables from outside are visible in here? What are, which ones are referenced in here? Which ones are value in here? If I had an integer i over here, could I use this in my lambda expression and do something with it? If I change the value of that i, will it change outside? Things like that. So if I run this program, this runs exactly like the, this runs the exact same way. There's absolutely no difference. It actually works and everything's fine. So enter the mark at, and as you see, it, it is the exact same thing. So this is the integer. Now if I go over here minus 10, it's going to say invalid mark. So it is doing the same thing that the other one did, okay? Um, but uh, there is a specific name for that. Let me just bring it up over here. Capture list, they call it. Parameter declaration, optional return type, if you want to return anything, okay? So this is actually one of the reasons that we have the new syntax. Because if you want to create a lambda expression, you cannot have the thing at the back, right? That's why you put it on front. And that's why one of the reasons that the syntax is created, okay? So, so capture list essentially tells if you want to access things that are outside by reference, by value, or you want specific ones to be by reference, others by value. 
Uh, an empty list essentially is the simplest one that I just mentioned. But if I, um, so um, this is an example of what you see exactly. So uh, as, again, it says auto, hello, and then sets the hello to this one. So this hello essentially becomes a pointer to this Lambda expression, and you can reuse it, which is kind of, if I wanted to do that, I would write a function. But anyways, but that's it. Lambda expressions are usually when you want to do something within something else, and you want to have a quick uh, uh, setup for it. Are we, uh, are we OK with this code over here? It's the exact same thing that I have written in the other one, but simple, right? Now, there is a pro there is a difference if you want to like read this lab lambda. There's like three lines of thing over here, and it tells you, yeah, if I if I write a, if I put an ampersand over here now, this k over here that is used will actually change the k uh, k because it's now everything in within the scope that is using will be by reference. If it wasn't there, then it would. If it's uh, um, uh, if it's an equal sign you put over there, it means everything's going to be by value. But this capture list, like this, it's okay and easy to work. But if you want to pass lambda expressions as arguments to other things, you cannot use a pointer to function anymore. If you want to use a capture list, because Pointer to function are essentially a fallback to C language. It doesn't have the cap capability of reference checking and see what scope is what. For that, you have to do something else. Now get ready for that. It is not mentioned in here. I don't know if it's going to be mentioned anywhere else during in this in, in OP345. I guess it will be, but I haven't seen it over here. So um, I just put it up for you. So you know what I'm talking about. And that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have one minute to tell you what it is. It's three. Do we have a class after this? Yeah. Anybody have class after this? How dare you? <laughs> okay. Let me see. Let me see if I can. <laughs> it's being recorded. Please. <laughs> now, now the teacher's going to say, did you just say? My class doesn't matter. OK, so that's the one example for it. Let me just bring the examples up. There you go. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me just close everything in here. I don't know if I can get to exceptions or, or you have enough energy to listen to it. And I didn't even talk about other things in this page, in this thing. Uh, quite frankly, I didn't think that I will be able to finish it. So. Uh, the next day you're coming for a lab, uh, you're going to have, whoops, wrong one. Actually, just let me explain it right over here. OK, I'm not going to change these. So um, as you see the code, this is the, 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 the old code that I had. Where is the other one? This is what I had over here, you see? Take a look, take a look, take a look, take a look. You see this one? It has nothing in it, right? But remember the number of tries that I wanted to try? See how many times it tried? Now I want to actually add to the number of tries if they did that. A lambda expression doesn't have a state. It's just a function. But I could use the variables in its outer scope to use it as state. So essentially, I could you put the, an integer try 0 over there, say everything's referred to by reference, and then add to the number of tries inside my lambda expression. OK? Problem is that with this, I cannot use pointer to functions. This is when I have to include functional header file. Functional header file essentially turns C++. It gives you, lets you do functional programming, which is essentially what you see right now, lambda expressions. So instead of creating Instead of creating a regular pointer to function, I'm going to say create a function for me of type Boolean that re receives an integer and, uh, and a reference integer and call it lambda valid. doesn't have to be lambda valid. I just call it lambda so you know it's lambda. Okay? So 
you have to actually use this template to create the pointer to that function, if I could call it, or reference to that function. And now you can actually, and you have to pass exactly that to your, uh, and as you see, this time I made it a, uh, uh, no, it's actually, this one is a, a pointer too. But anyways, so now it's null, and as you see, lambda valid argument is right over here. It's the exact same thing with set and everything. Now if I come back over here, you'll see that the only difference is that my type is now a function from functional header file. And everything else is essentially identical. You cannot use good old pointer to functions, C pointer to functions for this. You actually have to create a function object for that. And that's in function. And that's the end of functions. But There was something wrong with modules that we had in the code that I have to explain. It was talking about uh, static modules and uh, so it was a piece that we had over there um, that I fixed it. So let me just put it up here. That's So, so if I have these two in two different modules, so this is in one file, okay? This is in uh, linkage.cpp, uh, B, and the main one is linkage A.cpp. Essentially what it says is that if you make a standalone function static, it becomes internal linkage, which means it's not going to be visible to other, uh, other modules. But uh, a regular one, you could put external in front of it, but it's redundant. You don't need to write anything that you don't write a function. Any prototype that you don't write external in front of it is automatically extern in C language, which means it's available. That's why you, put a, you, you write a code and you put a prototype of a function in one module and, in, and it finds it out in another module because it's an external reference. And that's an obvious thing, right? So that's that one. Uh, I'll put this one up too. So if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, the text over here, it, this doesn't. I don't know if he fixed it or not. Did he fix it? Yeah, I think it's fixed. Yeah, he fixed it last night. Nice. Okay, good. So it's fixed. Forget about it. I don't know why I'm talking about it. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Um, I know you want to leave. Give me two seconds. Let me see if there is. Actually, forget. I just wanted to talk about Hanoi Towers and recur recursion. So essentially, um, I uh, made a fancy schmancy PowerPoint presentation for you too on it to see what Hanoi Towers are and how they work. But sadly, uh, we didn't have so. So the next time you're coming in, we'll be doing this using a program. So. Next time you come in, we're going to do this. OK? So we're going to learn how we're going to, so, so we're going to learn how we're going to play this game. So we move disks from A to B without putting the bigger one and smaller one to see how many movements you can actually do that. You see? Something like that. OK? That's actually 16. But, but yeah, so you can write a program that does that for you using recursion. So. I'll explain it next time. Have a beautiful day.